Chapter Eleven of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That very night, Mister Devlin come down to this room without, with your leave or by your leave, where Lemon and me was setting, having our regular game of cribbage for a ha'penny a game, and drawing a chair up to the table, he begun to talk as though he'd known us all his life, and he can talk, sir, by the hour and it never seems to tire him, whatever it does with other people. Lemon was took with him, and couldn't keep his eyes off him. No more could I, sir, no more could you if he was here. You might try your hardest, but it wouldn't be a bit of good. There's something in him as forces you to look at him, just as there's something in that bird and the stone figure on the mantel-shelf, and Lemon's portrait as forces you to look at them. I've found out the reason of that. When Devlin ain't here, he leaves his spirit behind him. That's how it is. I was never frightened of the dark before he come into the house. But now the very thought of going into a room of a night without a candle makes me shiver. And many and many's the time, as I've been going upstairs, that I've turned that faint there's no describing. He's been behind me, sir, coming up after me, step by step. I can't see him. I can't hear him, but I feel him, and yet there ain't a soul in sight but me. At them times I'm frightened to look at the wall for fear of seeing his shatter. Well, sir, on the night that he comes into this parlour, he goes on talking and talking, and then proposes a hand at cribbage, which Lemon was only too glad to say yes to. "'Mrs. Lemon must play,' said Devlin. "'We'll have a three-handed game.' I shouldn't have minded being left out, especially as our cribbage board only pegs for two, but his word was lore. So we begun to play, and Devlin marks his score with a red pencil. The things he did while we played made my flesh creep. He threw out his card for crib without looking at it, and told us how much was in crib while the cards was laying backs up on the table, and when Lemon and me both of us slow counters, began to reckon what we had in our hands, Mr. Devlin, like a flash of lightning, cried out how many we was to take. We played five games, and he won em all. Then he said he'd show us some tricks. Sir, the like of them tricks was never seen before or since. I've seen conjurers in my time, but not one who could hold a candle to Mr. Devlin. He made the cards fly all over the room, and while he held the pack in his hand, and you was looking at em, they'd disappear before your very eyes. "'Where would you like em to be?' he asked. "'Underneath you? On your chair? Get up! You're sitting on em. In your work-box? Open it, and behold em. And there they was, sir, sure enough, underneath me, though I'd never stirred from my seat or in my work-box, which was at the other end of the room. It wasn't conjuring, sir, it was something I can't put a name to, and it wasn't natural. I could hardly move for fright, and as I looked at Mr. Devlin, he seemed to grow taller and thinner, and his black eyes became blacker, and his moustaches curled up to his nose till they as good as met. But Lemon didn't feel as I felt. He was that delighted that he kept on crying. "'Wonderful! Beautiful! Do it again, Mr. Devlin! Do it again! Show us another!' I don't know when I've seen him so excited. That Devlin had bewitched him. "'We're brothers, you and me,' said Devlin to him. "'I am yours, and you are mine, and we'll never part. The very word, sir, he'd used to me.' "'Hooray!' cried Lemon. "'We're brothers, you and me, and we'll never, never part.' "'I once kept a barber's shop myself,' said Devlin. "'What?' cried Lemon. "'Are you one of us?' "'I am,' said Devlin. "'And I've worked for the best in the trade, for Truefit and Shipwright, and all the rest of them. I've been abroad studying the new styles. I'll show you something as'll make you open your eyes. Something splendid. And before I knew where I was, sir, Devlin, in his shirt-sleeves, had whipped a large towel round my neck, and had my hair all down, and was beginning to dress it. Where he got the towel from, and the combs, and the curling tongs, and the fire, goodness only knows. 
I didn't see him take them from nowhere. But there they was on the table, and there was Devlin, with his hands in my hair, frizzing it up and corkscrewing it, and twisting and twirling it, and me setting in the chair for all the world as if I'd been turned into stone. But though I didn't have the power to move, I could think about things, and what come into my head was that the man as had taken the second-floor front must be some unearthly creature, sprung from I won't mention where. "'Do you really believe so?' whispered Devlin in my ear. "'Believe what?' I asked, though my throat was that hot and dry that I wondered how he could make out what I said. "'That I am an unearthly creature,' he said softly, sprung from a place which shouldn't be mentioned to ears perlite. "'If I was petrified before, sir, you may guess how I felt when I found out that he knew what I was thinking of.' "'You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be,' he whispered again. "'Shouldn't be what?' I managed to get out, though the words almost stuck to the roof of my mouth. "'Sorry you ever took me as a lodger,' he said with a grin. "'Fie, fie! It isn't grateful of you after such a good reference as I give you. Something'll happen to you if you don't mind.' "'Well, sir, it was true I'd thought it, but I'll take my solemn oath I never spoke it. It was just as though that Devlin had my brains spread open before him, and could see every thought as was passing through him. I was so overcome that I as good as swooned away, and I believe I should have gone off in a dead faint if he hadn't put something strong to my nose as made me almost sneeze my head off. And while I was sneezing, there was Devlin and Lemon laughing fit to burst themselves. All the time he was dressing my hair, that sort of thing was going on. There wasn't a thought that come into my head that he didn't tell me of the minute it was there, till he got me into that state that I hardly knew whether I was asleep or awake. At last, sir, he finished me up, and stepping back a little, he waved his hand and said to Lemon, "'There! What do you think of that?' meaning my hair. "'Wonderful! Beautiful!' cried Lemon clapping his hands and jumping up and down in his chair, he was that excited. I never saw nothing like it in all my whole-born days. It's a new style, quite a new style, and so taking, the ladies'll go wild over it. Where did you get it from? From a place, said Devlin, grinning right in my face, as shall be nameless. But you'll tell me some day, won't you? cried Lemon because there might be other styles there as good as that, and we could make our fortunes out of them. "'I'll take you there one day,' said Devlin, with an unearthly laugh, "'and you shall see for yourself.' "'Do, do!' screamed Lemon. "'I'd give anything in the world to go there with you.' "'Good Lord, save him!' I thought, looking at Lemon whose eyes was almost starting out of his head. "'He's going mad! He's going mad!' as to making our fortunes devlin went on why not it shall be so it shall it shall cried lemon we'll make hundreds thousands said devlin we will we will cried lemon fanny shall ride in her own carriage fanny shall said devlin the lord forbid i thought that i should ever ride in a carriage bought at such a price I thought more free now that Devlin's hands was not in my hair. He didn't seem to be able to read what I was thinking of so long as we was apart. "'I bind myself to you,' said Devlin to my poor dear Lemon, "'and you bind yourself to me. The bargain's made. Your hand upon it.' Lemon gave him his hand, and whether it was fancy or not, it seemed to me that Devlin grew and grew till he almost touched the ceiling and that, while he was bending over Lemon and looking down on him, like one of them vampires you've read of, sir. Lemon kept growing smaller and smaller till he was no better than a bag of bones. "'We go out to-morrow morning,' said Devlin, "'you and me together, to look for a shop. Is it agreed?' "'It is,' answered Lemon. "'It is.' "'We will set London on fire,' said Devlin. "'We will, we will,' said Lemon and we'll have shops all over it.' "'You're a man of spirit,' said Devlin. 
I kiss your hand. He said that to me, but I clapped my hands behind my back. If you refuse, said Devlin, smiling at me all the while, I must show Lemon another style. And he made as though he was about to dress my hair again. No, no, I screamed, anything but that, anything but that. I give him my hand and he kissed it. His mouth was like burning hot coals, and I wondered I wasn't scarred. "'Don't forget,' said Lemon, "'tomorrow morning.' "'I'll not forget,' said Devlin. "'Till then, adieu.' The next minute he was gone. No sooner did he close the door behind him than I felt as if tons weight had been lifted off me. I started up and put my hands to my hair, intending to pull it down. "'What are you doing?' cried Lemon, starting up too, and seizing hold of me. "'Don't touch it! Don't touch it! I must study the style. I never saw such a thing in all my life. It's more than wonderful. It's stupendous. You look like another woman. Just take a sight of yourself in the glass.' I did take a sight of myself in the glass, and if you'll believe me, sir, it seemed as if my head was covered with millions of little serpents, curling and twisting all sorts of ways at once. And as I looked at em moving, sir, which might have been, or might not have been, but so it was to me, I saw millions of eyes shining and glaring at me. "'Oh, Lemon, Lemon!' I cried, bursting out into tears. "'What have you done? What have you done?' "'Done?' said Lemon, rubbing his hands he'd let mine go. Why, gone into partnership with the finest hairdresser as ever was seen. Our fortune's made, Fanny, our fortune's made. I tried to reason with him, but I might as well have spoke to stone. He was that worked up that he wouldn't listen to a word I said. All the satisfaction I could get out of him was, a good night's work, Fanny, a good night's work. If he said it once, he said it fifty times. But I knew it was the worst night's work Lemon had ever done, and that it had come to bad. And it has, sir. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I had my way about my hair before I went to bed. I waited till Lemon was asleep, and then I brushed all the serpents out, and did it up in a plain knot behind. I felt then like a Christian, and I said my prayers before I stepped in between the sheets. I didn't sleep much. Lemon was that restless, he torsed and torsed the whole night long, and his eyes was quite bloodshot when he got up. While he was dressing I heard Devlin call out, "'Lemon, I'm coming down to have breakfast with you.' "'Do!' cried Lemon. "'You're heartily welcome.' I was downstairs at the time, I always get up before Lemon, to make the place straight and cook the breakfast, and I heard what passed. Lemon, half-dressed, come running down to me, and told me to be sure to get something nice for breakfast, and not to cut the rashers too thin. "'Go to the fish-shop,' he said and get a haddock. We must treat him well, Fanny, or he might cry off the bargain he made with me last night. I thought to myself I knew how I'd treat him if I had my way, but it wouldn't have done just then for me to go again, Lemon. There was times when he said a thing that it had to be done, and that was one of them. So I goes to the fishmongers and gets a haddock, and I cooks three large rashers and six eggs, three fried and three biled, and then Lemon and Devlin, they come in together as thick as thieves. Devlin had been telling Lemon something as had made him laugh till his face was purple. "'You never heard such a man,' said Lemon to me. "'He's one in a thousand. "'He's one in millions, I thought, and kept my head down for fear Devlin should suspect what I was thinking of. "'And there's only one as ever I heard of.' Devlin give me a good morning and shook hands with me. I didn't dare to refuse him. If he'd offered to kiss me, Lemon wouldn't have objected, I believe, though there was a time when he was that jealous of me that a man hardly dared to look at me. 
but those happy days was gone for ever. I didn't have much appetite for breakfast, and no more had lemon, but Devlin made up for the pair of us. There was the haddock, and there was the three rashers, and there was the six eggs. Devlin pretty well cleared the lot. It was Lemon, I must say, who pushed him on to it, though it didn't seem to me as he wanted much persuading. He had the appetite of a shark. It didn't give me no pleasure to hear him praise my cooking, and to hear him say to Lemon that he'd got a treasure of a wife. "'I have,' said Lemon. "'Fanny's a good sort.' When breakfast was over, and everything cleared away, Lemon asked Devlin if he was ready, and Devlin said he was, and they went out arm in arm, just as if they was brothers. They come home late, and Lemon was more excited than ever. "'It's all settled, Fanny,' he said. "'I've taken another shop, and Devlin and me's gone into partnership. We're going to work together, and we'll astonish your weak nerves.' as if they hadn't been astonished enough already. I asked Lemon where the shop was that he'd taken, but he wouldn't tell me. "'It's a secret,' he said, "'between Devlin and me. What an extraordinary man he is, Fanny! What a glorious, glorious fellow! What a fortunate thing that he saw the bill in our window of a room to let, and that he didn't go somewheres else! It's a providence, Fanny, that's what it is.' I wasn't to be put down so easy, and I tried my hardest to get out of Lemon where the shop was, but he wouldn't let on. "'I've promised Devlin,' he said, "'not to say a word about it to a living soul. Perhaps we shan't keep it open long. Perhaps we shall shut it up after a month or two, and take another. Perhaps we shall do a lot of trade at private houses. It's all as Devlin likes. I've given him the lead. There never was such a man.' That was all I could get out of him. Devlin had him tight. Twas nothing but Devlin this and Devlin that, and Devlin t'other. Devlin was as close as he was. I couldn't get nothing out of him. "'I love women,' he said. "'But they must be kept in their place. Eh, Lemon?' "'That was a nice thing for a wife to hear, wasn't it?' "'Yes,' said Lemon. "'You mind your business, Fanny, and we'll mind ourn.' They went out the next morning together, and kept out late again, and so it went on for a matter of four or five weeks. Then there come a change. From being in love with Devlin, Lemon begun to be frightened of him. I saw it in his face every morning when they went away. Instead of Lemon's taking Devlin's arm as he did at first, it was Devlin who used to take Lemon's arm, just above the elbow jint, as much as to say, I've got you, and I'm not going to let you escape me. And instead of Lemon being brisk and lively and excited of a morning, as though he was going for an excursion in a pleasure van, he got grumpy and dull, as though he was going to the lock-up to answer for some dreadful thing he'd done. I spoke to him about it, but if he was close before, he was a thousand times closer now. Don't ask me nothing, Fanny, he'd say. Don't put questions to me about him. I daren't say a word. I daren't. I daren't. That didn't stop me. He was my husband, and if strange things was being done, who had a better right than me to know all about him? But it was all no use. I couldn't get nothing out of him. If you don't shut up, he said, quite savage-like, I'll set Devlin on to you, and you'll have cause to remember it to the last day of your life just as if I haven't got cause to remember it. If I lived a thousand years, I couldn't forget what's happened. If I could have got rid of my lodger, I shouldn't have thought twice about it. Out he'd have gone, but he paid me regular, did Devlin, and always in advance, so that I had no excuse for giving him notice. And even if I had, I ain't at all sure that I should have had the courage to do it. It begun to trouble me more than I can say that I never heard him come in or go out, and that I never caught the sound of his footsteps on the stairs or in the passage, and that, when he might have been in the Canary Islands for all I knew, I'd turn my head and see him standing at the back of me, without my having the least idea how he got into the room. "'Here I am, you see, Mrs. Lemon,' he'd say, "'back again, like a bad penny. You're glad to see me, I'm sure. Say you're glad.' 
and I had to, whether I liked it or not. Then he'd grin and wag his head at me, and sometimes say if he knew where there was another woman like me, he'd stick up to her. Lord, have mercy, I used to think, on the woman who'd give you a second look unless she was obliged to. I grew to be that shaky and trembly that my life was a perfect misery, and so was Lemon's. But I used to speak about it, which was a little relief, while poor Lemon would never so much as open his lips. I pitied him a deal more than I did myself. I did say to him once, Lemon, let's call a broker in when Devlin's not here, and sell the furniture and run away. You talk like a fool, said Lemon. If we was to hide ourselves in the bowels of the earth, he'd ferret us out. Then Lemon said one night that Devlin was going to paint our portraits. He shan't paint mine, I cried, not if he offered to frame it in diamonds. The words was no sooner out of my lips than I turned almost to a jelly at hearing Devlin's voice at the back of me saying, "'Nonsense, nonsense, Mrs. Lemon. Surely it ain't me you're speaking of? Don't they paint all the court beauties, and ain't you as good as the best of em? Your face is like milk and roses, and I'm the artist that's going to do justice to it. You can't refuse me. You won't have the heart to refuse me.' which I hadn't, with him so close to me. He seemed to take the backbone out of me. I used to feel quite limp when he took me up like that. He did paint my picture, and there it is, stuck on the wall, and though it's come over me a hundred times to drag it down and burn it, it's more than I dare do for fear of something dreadful happening. I can't describe what I went through while that picture was being painted. There was I, setting like a stature, in the position that Devlin placed me. And there was Lemon, leaning forward, with his hands clasping the arms of his chair, and his eyes glaring like a ghost's. And there was Devlin, waving his brush and painting me, making all sorts of strange remarks, and singing all sorts of songs in all sorts of languages. He could do that, sir. I don't believe there's a language in the world that he can't speak and I don't believe there's anything in the world, or out of it, for that matter, that he doesn't know. Now, where did he get it all from? I used to wonder about his age. It was a regular puzzler. Sometimes he looked quite young, and sometimes he looked as old as Methuselah. I plucked up courage once to ask him. "'What do you say to twenty? he answered. "'Or, if that won't do, what do you say to eighty? Or a couple of hundred? When my portrait was finished, he pretended to go into ecstasies over it, and said that it really ought to be exhibited. "'Mind you keep it as an heirloom,' he said. "'You've no notion what it's worth.' Then he took Lemon's picture, and it was a comfort to me that he painted my husband upstairs. Every night for a fortnight Lemon went up to Devlin's room, and sat there for two or three hours, and then he'd slide into this room, looking as if he'd just come out of his coffin. It gave me such a shock when I first saw the picture that I threw my apron over my head. "'Ah!' said Devlin with a grin, pulling my apron away. "'I thought you'd be overcome when you set eyes on it. It's a rare piece of work, ain't it? Why, it almost speaks!' It was as like Lemon as like could be. I couldn't deny that. But there was the sly, wicked look which you've noticed in that there stuffed bird and in the stone image on the mantel-shelf. Devlin made us a present of them things after he painted the portraits, and told me to treasure em for his sake, and that whenever I looked at em I was to think of him. He said they was worth ever so much money, but that I was never, never to part with em. If you do, he said, laughing in my face, I'll haunt you day and night. So things went on, getting worser and worser every day, and Lemon got that thin that you could almost blow him away. And now, sir, I'm coming to the most dreadful part of the whole affair, something that has frightened me more than all the rest put together. What I'm going to speak of now is that awful murder in Victoria Park. Don't think I'm making it up out of my head. I ain't clever enough or wicked enough. If I was, I should deserve a judgment to fall on me. I've told you of Lemon speaking in his sleep, 
never did he go to bed without saying things in the night that'd send my heart into my mouth he seemed as if he was haunted by shadders and spirits and as if there was always something weighing on his soul that he daren't let out when he was awake when I found it was no good arguing with him, I give it up, and I bore with his writhes and groans, without telling him in the morning of the dreadful night I'd passed. But the day before yesterday, sir, things come to a head. He went out early with Devlin, as usual, and they both come home together a deal later than they was in the habit of doing. I fixed the time in my dairy, sir. It was half-past eight o'clock before that i'd wrote my letter to you and posted it the letter you got yesterday morning little did i dream of what was going to happen after i sent it off i noticed that lemon was more trembly than ever and there was that in his eyes which made my heart bleed for him it wasn't a wandering look because he was afraid to look behind him it was as if he was trying to shut out something horrible but i didn't say a word to him while devlin was with us he didn't remain long i'm going to my room he said i've got a lot of writing to do bring me up a pot of tea before you go to bed lemon and me's been spending a pleasant hour at the twisted cow lemon looks as if he's been spending a pleasant hour i thought as i looked at his white face then devlin went to his room on the second floor and i breathed more free the twisted cow sir is a public which devlin is fond of you may be sure he'd pick out a house with an outlandish name. "'Oh, Lemon, Lemon,' I said, "'you look like a ghost.' "'Hush,' he said, with his hand to his ear. He was afraid Devlin might be listening. "'Don't speak to me, Fanny. I want to be quiet, very quiet. How horrible, how horrible!' "'What's horrible, Lemon?' I asked, putting my arms round his neck. He pushed me away, and asked what I meant. You said, how horrible, how horrible, just now, Lemon. To my surprise he answered, I didn't. You must have fancied it. Let me be quiet. I didn't dispute him, and we sat here in the parlour for more than an hour without saying a word to each other. Lemon hadn't been drinking, sir. He was as sober as I am this minute. I think I'll go to bed, Fanny, he said the tears come into my eyes he spoke so soft shall i go and get your supper beer lemon i asked no he said catching hold of me i won't be left alone in the house with that that devil upstairs i don't want no supper beer it was the first time he'd ever spoke of devlin in that way and i knew that something out of the common must have happened perhaps they'd quarrelled oh how i hoped they had it might put an end to their partnership, and there would be a chance of peace and happiness once more. "'I won't leave you, Lemon,' I said. "'I'll take that wretch his tea, and I hope it'll choke him, and then I'll come to bed, too. Shall I make you some gruel, Lemon, or anything else you fancy?' "'No,' he answered. "'I don't want nothing. Only to sleep, to sleep.' I made the tea for Lemon and it's a mercy I didn't have any poison in the house, because I might have been tempted to put it in the pot, though perhaps that wouldn't have hurt him. I knocked at his door, and he said as pleasant as pleasant can be, Come in, Mrs. Lemon, what a treasure you are, how happy Lemon ought to be with such a wife. But I didn't stop to talk to him. I put the tea on the table and went down to Lemon. He was already in bed, and his head was covered with the bedclothes i'll just run down i whispered and put the chain on the street door i won't be a minute lemon i was back in less than that and i went to bed lemon never moved i spoke to him but he didn't answer me and after a little while i went to sleep i woke up as the clock struck twelve all in a perspiration lemon was talking in his sleep and this is what he said victoria park eighteen years old golden hair with a bunch of daisies in her belt a bunch of white daisies with blood on em with blood on em with blood on em oh lord have mercy on her near the water lord have mercy on her lord have mercy on her and then sir he gave a scream that curdled right through me and cried 
don't let him don't let him save her save her how would you feel sir if you heard someone laying by your side saying such things in the dead of night end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nothing more took place before we got up in the morning. Lemon tossed about as usual and kept groaning and talking to himself, but except what I've told you, I couldn't make head or tail of his mumblings. Devlin come down to breakfast and said, as gay as gay can be, "I've had a lovely night." have you said i i wouldn't have spoke if i could have helped it but he's got a way of forcing the words out of you yes he answered a most lovely night i've slept the sleep of the just what he meant by it i don't know but it's what he said you look tired mrs lemon he grinned in my face sir as he made the remark and my blood begun to boil i've got enough to make me look tired i said lemon hasn't had a decent night's rest for months you don't say so but why not why not asked devlin pitching into the ham and eggs you can answer that better than i can i said jumping from the table you yes you fanny cried lemon i don't care i said feeling reckless i think it must have been because i was sure you'd come to my help sir i don't care things aren't as they should be and it stands to reason they can't go on like this much longer oh said devlin helping himself to the last rasher it stands to reason does it yes it does i answered i'm lemon's wife and if he can't take care of hisself it's my duty to do it for him can't you take care of yourself asked devlin of my poor husband that's sad very sad i can i can cried lemon fanny don't know what she's talking about i thought as much said devlin nerves unstrung she wants bracing up i must prescribe for her not if i know it i said i've had enough of you and your prescribing to last me a lifetime don't look at me like that or you'll drive me mad was there ever such an unreasonable woman said devlin and he come and laid his hand upon me. Just see how she's shaking, Lemon. She's low, very low. I really must prescribe for her. Leave her to me. I'll see that no harm comes to her. With that his great staring eyes pierced me through and through, and his hand patting my shoulder and his mocking voice, and the grin on his face, all my courage melted clean away, and I burst out crying and run into the kitchen there i stayed till i heard the street door slam and then i went back to clear the breakfast things with a thankful heart that devlin was gone if he'd only have left my husband behind him i should have been satisfied but lemon was gone too there was a bottle on the table with something in it and a label on it in devlin's writing for my dear kind friend mrs lemon a tonic for her nerves a tablespoon in water three times a day a tablespoonful in water three times a day thinks i to myself not if i know it i was going to throw the bottle in the dust hole but i thought i'd better not and i put it away on the top shelf of the cupboard right at the back after that i went about my work wondering how it was all going to end and casting about in my mind whether there was anything i could do to get rid of the creature as was making our lives a misery but I couldn't think of nothing. Lemon was never very fond of politics, but he likes to know what's going on, and we take in a penny weekly newspaper as gives all the news from one end of the week to the other, and how they do it for the money beats me holler. The boy brings it every Sunday morning, and it ain't once in a year that Lemon buys a daily paper. You'll see presently why I mention it. It was five o'clock in the afternoon, and I was setting sewing when I hears the latch-key in the street door. Now, Saturday is always a late day with Lemon and Devlin. They don't generally come home till ten or eleven o'clock at night, and I was surprised when I heard the key in the lock. 
I knew it must be one or the other of em, because nobody but them and me has a latch-key. I sat and listened, wondering whether it was Lemon and what had brought him home so early, and I made up my mind, if it was him, to have a good talk with him, and try and persuade him once more to give up Devlin altogether. But why don't he come in? thought I. There he was, in the street, fumbling about with the key as though there was something wrong with it, and he stayed there so long that I couldn't stand it no longer, so I goes to the door and opens it myself. The minute it was open, Lemon reels past me, behaving hisself as if he was mad or drunk. I picked up the latch-key which he'd dropped, and followed him into the parlour here. What made him catch hold of me, and moan, and cry, and look round as if he'd brought a ghost in with him, and it was standing at his elber? And what made him suddenly cover his face with his hands, and after trembling like a aspen leaf, tumbled down on the floor in a fit right before my very eyes? There he laid, sir, twisting and foaming, a sight I pray I may never see again. I knelt down, quick, and undid his neck handkerchief and tried to bring him to, but he got worse and worse, and all I could do wasn't a bit of good. There was nobody in the house but Lemon and me, and almost distracted, I run like mad to the chemist's shop at the corner of the second turning to the right, who's got a son walking the hospitals, and begged him to come with me and see my poor man. He come at once, sir, and there was Lemon still on the floor in his fit. The doctor unclasped Lemon's hands, and put something in him, and I slipped a cold key down his back, because his nose was bleeding. "'That's a good sign,' said the doctor, as he forced Lemon's jaws apart, and put a spoon between his teeth, which Lemon almost bit in two. Then he threw a jug of cold water into Lemon's face, completely saturating him, and after that Lemon wasn't so violent, but he didn't recover his senses or open his eyes. "'Let's get him to bed,' said the doctor. He helped me carry Lemon upstairs, where we undressed him, and it wasn't before we got him between the sheets that he come to. "'Feel better?' asked the doctor. But Lemon never spoke. "'Don't leave him,' said the doctor to me, and he went back to his shop and brought a sleeping draught, which Lemon took and soon afterwards fell asleep. "'He won't wake,' said the doctor, "'for twelve hours at least.' is he subject to fits? No, sir, I answered. This is the first he's ever had. Can you tell me what's the matter with him? He ain't been drinking, has he? There's no sign of drink, said the doctor, and no smell of it. Does he drink? Not more than is good for him, I said. I've never seen Lemon the worse for liquor. What I don't like about him, the doctor then said, was the look in his eyes when he come to his senses as if he'd had a shock. Has he taken a religious turn? No, sir. Is he superstitious at all? No, sir. The reason I ask, Mrs. Lemon, said the doctor, is because this don't seem to me a ordinary fit. Is there any madness in your husband's family? I never heard of any, I answered, and I think I should have been sure to know if there was. Very likely, said the doctor, though sometimes they keep it dark. All I can say is, there's something on Mr. Lemon's mind, or he's received a mental shock. With that he went away. Lemon by that time was sound as a top. The doctor must have given him a strong dose to overcome him so, and it did my heart good to see him laying so peaceful. But I couldn't help thinking over what the doctor had said of him. There was either something on Lemon's mind, or he'd received a mental shock and that was said without the doctor knowing what I knew, for I kept my troubles to myself. I didn't as much as whisper what Lemon had said in his sleep the night before about the young girl in Victoria Park, with golden hair and a bunch of white daisies in her belt, covered with blood. Perhaps Lemon's been reading a story, I thought, with something like that in it, and it's took hold of him. There was nothing to wonder at in that, the penny newspaper we take in always has a story in it that goes on from week to week, and always ending at such an aggravating part that I can hardly wait to get the next number. I fly for it the first thing Sunday morning, before I read anything else. 
Lemon goes for the police courts, and takes the story afterwards. My mind was running on in that way as I picked up Lemon's clothes, which the doctor and me had tore off him and throwed on the floor. And I don't mind telling you, sir, that I felt in the pockets. First his trousers. There was nothing in him but a few coppers and two and six in silver. Then his waistcoat. There was nothing in that but his silver watch and a button that had come off. Then his coat. What I found there was his handkerchief, his spectacles, and a evening newspaper. I folded his clothes tidy, and come downstairs with the paper in my hand. There must be something particular in it, thinks I, as I sat down in the parlour here, and opened it in the middle, and smoothed it out. There was, sir. The very first words I saw, in big letters, at the top of the column was, dreadful and mysterious discovery in victoria park ruthless murder of a young girl stabbed to the heart a bunch of blood-stained daisies can you imagine my feelings sir i could scarce believe my eyes but there it was staring me in the face like a great bill on the walls printed in red the ink was black of course but as i looked at the awful words they grew larger and larger and their colour seemed to change to the colour of blood. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Now, sir, while I was looking in a state of days at the paper, and trying to pluck up courage to read it, I felt a chill down the small of my back, and I knew that our lodger, Devlin, had crept into the room unbeknown, without me hearing him. "'What is this I've been told as I come along?' he said. "'My friend Lemon, your worthy husband, taken ill? It is sad news. Is he very ill? Let me see him.' "'What I did do, sir, but run out of the room and upstairs where Lemon was sleeping, and whip out the key from the inside of the door, and put it in the outside, and turn the lock. Then I felt I could breathe, and I went downstairs to Devlin. "'Why do you lock the poor man in?' he asked. "'How do you know,' I said, "'that I have locked him in, unless you've been spying on me?' "'Ha! <laughs> ha! How do I know what I know?' he said, laughing. "'Ah!' if i explained you might not understand perhaps there's little i don't know i've travelled the world over mrs lemon and there's no saying what i've learnt as for spying fie fie my dear landlady but you must be satisfied i suppose being a woman have you ever heard of second sight it's a wonderful gift perhaps i've got it perhaps i can see with my eyes shut such things are but this is trifling poor lemon i am really concerned for him you mustn't keep me away from him i'm a doctor and can do him a power of good not i said and where i got the courage from in the state i was in goodness only knows while there's a breath in my body shall you doctor my husband mischief enough you've done you don't do no more mischief you foolish woman he said what mischief have you took leave of your senses but I didn't answer him. Ah, oh, well, he said, shrugging his shoulders, let it be as you wish with my poor friend Lemon. I yield always to a lady. What is this? And he took up the newspaper. You've been reading, I see, the particulars of this sad case. It is more than sad. It is frightful. I haven't read it, I said. But you was going to? I won't be mean myself by denying it i said yes i was going to when you come into the room unbeknown and unbeware i had it in my mind to say that it was a liberty to come into a room as didn't belong to him without first knocking at the door but his black eyes was fixed on me and his moustache was curling up to his nose and i didn't dare to when i come into the room he said unbeknown and unbeware as you express it you had no ears for anything. You were staring at the paper, and your eyes was wild. What for? Is it a murder that frightens you? Foolish, stupid, because murders are so common. 
how many people go to bed at night and never rise from it again because of what happens while they sleep this murder is strange in a sort of way but not clever no not clever a young girl eighteen years of age beautiful very beautiful with hair of gold and eyes of blue receives a letter from her lover who shall say that is yet to be discovered in the future meet me the letter says in victoria park at the old spot which proves my dear landlady that they have met before in the same place at eleven o'clock to-night an imprudent hour for a girl so young but then what will not love dare when you and lemon was according didn't you meet him whenever he asked you at all sorts of out-of-the-way places it is what lovers do without asking why and where the letter goes on in your belt a bunch of white daisies so that i may know it is you now why that it is the request of a bungler if the letter was wrote by her lover and there is at present no reason to suppose otherwise he would recognize his sweetheart without a bunch of white daisies in her belt what then is the explanation that also is in the future to be discovered let us imagine something say that between the young girl with the hair of gold and the eyes of blue and the man that writes the letter there is a secret the discovery of which will be bad for him pardon you wish to ask something yes i said about the letter how do you know it was wrote did i say i know he answered with his slyest wickedest look ain't we imagining simply imagining being in the dark we must find some point to commence at and nothing can be more natural than a letter was it found in the young lady's pocket i asked nothing was found he answered in the young lady's pocket then it ain't possible i said that the letter could have been wrote sweet innocence said devlin and with all these dreadful goings on sir that was making me tremble in my shoes he had the impudence to chuck me under the chin and lemon upstairs in the state he was what could be easier than to empty a young lady's pockets when she's laying dead before you a job any fool could do but the letter may be found and the murderer too i said with a shudder and hanged i hope i share your hope he said with one of his strange laughs by the neck till he is dead the more the merrier to continue our imaginings between the young lady and her lover as i said there's a secret as would be bad for him if it was made public as might indeed be the ruin of him this secret may be revealed in the correspondence as passed between them the chances are that those letters are not destroyed men are so indiscreet why they often forget there's a tomorrow the young lady is described as being beautiful more's the pity beauty's a snare if ever i marry which ain't likely mrs lemon i'll marry a fright beautiful as the young lady is her lover wishes to get rid of her perhaps he's tired of her perhaps he's got another fancy perhaps he's seen her twin sister and is smit with her there's any number of perhapses to fit the case but the poor girl having been brought to shame is that in the paper i asked interrupting him no he answered but it may be it is always so with those girls there's hardly a pin to choose between em naturally she won't consent to let him get rid of her won't consent to release him won't consent to let him go free they quarrel and make it up they quarrel again and make it up again days weeks go by till yesterday comes and she is to meet him at night she's got a mother she's got a father they set together and she goes to bed early she's got a headache she says and so good night mother good night father a kiss for each of em and there's a end of kisses and good nights the last page of her little book of life is reached there's a lot in that scene to make a body think it's full of pictures of the past think of all the days of childhood wasted think of all the love laughter hopes joys wasted flowers ribbons fancies dreams wasted 
all that good men say is sweetest in life and that's played its part for so many many years all wasted better to have been wicked at once better to have been sinful and deceitful all through think you not so good night mother good night father and so to bed no to go up to her little room and lock the door to dress herself in her best clothes to make herself still more beautiful for that you see may melt her lover's heart to put the bunch of white daisies in her belt to wait till the house is quiet so quiet so quiet and then to steal out softly softly she stops at mother's door and listens not a sound mother and father sleep in peace remembrances of the past come to her in the dark and she cries a little very quietly then she departs it is done from that home she is gone for ever and she is walking to her grave the park is still and quiet at that hour of the night except for a few hungry wretches who prowl or sleep the girl and the man have it all to themselves first love passages twelve o'clock they stop and listen to the tolling of the bell they all do that some smile and sing at the chimes some shiver and groan next arguments entreaties to be released he will be so good to her oh so good if she will only release him one o'clock next more love-making and coaxing then threats passionate reproaches defiance ah it has come to that the end is near two o'clock he stabs her quick and sudden to the heart hark do you hear the wild scream her body is dead and her soul but that and other mysteries remain to be unravelled which may be never end of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Devlin put down the newspaper and waited for me to speak. I think, sir, I've told you exactly what he said, and as fur as possible in his own words. They are so printed on my mind that I couldn't forget him if I tried ever so hard. As he described what had took place, it was as if he was painting pictures and he made me see him. I saw the poor girl's home. I saw her setting with her father and mother in just such a little room as this, for they are only humble people, sir. I saw her kiss him good-night. I saw her in her bedroom a-doing herself up before the looking-glass. I saw her put the bunch of white daisies in her belt. I saw her steal out of the house to the park. I saw the man and her walking about among the trees, and sometimes setting down to talk. I heard a scream, another, another, and I covered my eyes with my hands to shut it all out. I was so overcome that I hadn't strength to wrench myself away from Devlin, who was smoothing my hair with his hands, but presently I managed to scream, "'Don't touch me! Don't touch me! You! You!' "'You what?' asked Devlin in his false voice, moving a little away from my chair my scream and him speaking again brought me to myself never mind never mind i said if you know what i'm thinking about it's no use my telling you i do know he said why it's wrote on your face and i know too that you want to ask me some questions fire away mr devlin i said upon that you slept at home last night didn't you certainly i did he answered don't you remember Lemon and me coming in together? Yes, I said, I remember. Don't you remember, he said, that you brought me up a cup of tea before you went to bed, and that I told you I had a lot of writing to do, and that I said what a treasure you was, and how happy Lemon ought to be with such a wife? Yes, I said, I remember. I couldn't say nothing else, it was the truth. Inspired by the excellent tea you make, he went on, I stopped up late and did my writing. If I mistake not, you put the chain on the street door before you went to bed. Yes, I did. And when you went down this morning, the chain was still up? Yes, it was. And I breakfasted with you and Lemon? Yes, you did. 
and i presume you made my bed some time during the day of course i did did it look as if it had been slept in yes so that you see my dear landlady he said grinning at me that it wasn't possible for me to have murdered the girl who said you did it i asked starting back for he had come close to me and i thought he was going to touch me again you didn't say so he said but you thought so it was wrote in your face as i told you a minute ago it is women like you who would put a man's life in danger and think no more of it than snuffing a candle he didn't remain with me much longer but went up to his room he was right in what he said he saw wrote in my face while he was smoothing my hair an idea had entered my head that it was him who had killed the poor girl i think him bad enough for anything there's nothing wicked i wouldn't believe of him but of course it wasn't possible for him to have done it and i thought with thankfulness it wasn't possible for lemon to have done it for he never stirred out of the house that night it was what lemon said in his sleep that made me tremble and shiver why sir he spoke of the murder before it was done it says in the papers that when the poor girl was found she had been dead hours and the doctor fixes it that she must have been murdered between two and three o'clock in the morning and two hours and a half before she was murdered lemon was raving in his sleep and telling all about it how did he know sir how did he know if it had been a ordinary case if lemon had only spoken his sleep about some murder or other and i'd read the next day that a murder had been committed that night it would have been strange but nothing so very much out of the way our minds sometimes runs on dreadful things enough to give one the creeps and we ain't accountable for everything we say when we're asleep but lemon said victoria park and it was done in victoria park he said eighteen years and that was just her age he said golden hair and she had golden hair he said a bunch of white daisies and she wore a bunch of white daisies he said blood on em and there was blood on em he said stab to the heart and she was stabbed to the heart i'll tell you sir what come to me and made me feel almost like a murderess it was that if i'd really known what was going to happen when i heard lemon talking in his sleep i might have saved the life of that poor girl but how was it possible for me to know still that didn't prevent me feeling like a guilty woman but how much did lemon know did the wretch who killed the girl tell him beforehand what he was going to do and was lemon wicked enough to keep it to himself? was the murderer an acquaintance of lemon's if he was i made up my mind that a hour shouldn't pass after lemon was awake this morning before i put the police on the wretch's track lemon would know his name and where he lived perhaps whatever was the consequences i'd do what i could to bring the monster into the dock i was more than sorry that the doctor had give lemon such a strong sleeping draught and i prayed that he would wake up sooner than i expected i went to the bedroom but there was lemon fast asleep with a face as innocent as a babe unborn he wasn't dreaming he wasn't talking his mind was at rest as well as his body you know more than i do sir could anybody with something dreadful on his mind have slept like that but my mind was made up the very minute lemon was sensible and knew what he was about to the police station he should go with me and make a clean breast of it End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I was that impatient that I hardly knew what to do. Minutes was like diamonds, and there Lemon lay like a log. Couldn't I bring him to his senses somehow or other? I tried i walked about heavy i threw down things i even turned lemon over but it had no more effect on him than water on a duck's back he never gives so much as a murmur and i don't think a earthquake would have aroused him i had to give it up as a bad job but i felt that it would be a mockery for me to go to bed because in the state i was in it wasn't likely i could get a wink of sleep 
then i knew too that there wouldn't be a minute to lose when lemon opened his eyes and that it was my duty to git everything ready so i spread out lemon's clothes in regular order not forgetting his clean sunday shirt and i put on my bonnet and cloak and set down and waited all through that blessed night looking at lemon i didn't hear a sound in the room upstairs so i supposed that devlin was asleep and i thought how dreadful it was to have a man like that in the house a man as spoke of murder as though he enjoyed it the only sound that come to my ears two or three times in the night was the policeman on his beat outside as he passed through the square and you may guess sir i didn't get any comfort out of that i had my fancies but i shook em off though they made me shake and shiver one of em was that all of a sudden just as the policeman had passed by there rung through the square shrieks of murder murder and millions of people seemed to be battering at the street door and crying that they'd tear lemon and me to pieces it didn't seem as if they wanted to hurt devlin for there he was standing and grinning at us and the people with that aggravating look on his face that makes me burn to fly at him if i only had the courage of course it was all fancy sir but how would you like to pass such a night at nine o'clock this morning and not a minute before lemon woke up i had a cup of tea ready for him in the bedroom and a slice of bread and butter he'd gone off his breakfast for a long time past and one slice of bread and butter is as much as he can get down if he can do that before i took devlin as a lodger lemon used to eat a big breakfast never less than a couple of rashers and a couple of boiled eggs on top of that and four or five slices of bread and butter cut thick it is a bad sign when a man begins to say he's got no appetite for breakfast if his stomach ain't going all to pieces it's something worse perhaps why fanny said lemon seeing me with my bonnet on have you been out what's the time he spoke quite calm and cheerful the sleeping draught had done him good and had made him forget the time's nine o'clock lemon i answered and i ain't been out what's to-day he asked sunday i answered sunday he exclaimed it's funny everything seems mixed sunday is it but i say fanny if you ain't been out what have you got your bonnet on for i'm waiting for you i said get up quick you must come with me at once come with you at once he said rubbing his eyes to make sure whether he was awake or asleep and then he must have seen something in my face for he looked at me strange and left off rubbing his eyes and began to rub his forehead i can't understand it has anything gone wrong lemon i said speaking very solemn and speaking as i felt you know too well what has gone wrong and i only hope you may be forgiven i shouldn't have stopped short in the middle if it hadn't been that we heard devlin moving about in the room upstairs i looked up at the ceiling and so did lemon and when i saw his face grow white i knew that mine was growing white as well and i knew too that lemon was getting his memory back speak low speak low he whispered devlin mustn't hear a word we say you hope i may be forgiven what for what have i done oh my head my head it feels as if it was going to burst his face begun to get flushed and the veins swelled out i thought to myself i must be careful with lemon i mustn't be too sudden with him or he'll have another fit i was going to speak soothing when he clapped his hands on my mouth and almost stopped my breath don't say nothing yet he said you must tell me something first that i want to know i feel so confused so confused what's been the matter with me i don't remember going to bed last night you fell down in a fit lemon i said and i had to get the doctor to you yes yes he said eagerly go on go on we carried you upstairs here the doctor and me and undressed you and put you to bed and when you come out of your fit he give you a sleeping draught it's not that i want to know he said what made me go into a fit i never had a fit before as i remember 
oh fanny is it all a dream lemon i answered you must ask your conscience i can't answer you you come home with the evening paper in your pocket a moaning and crying and you catches hold of me and looks round as if a ghost had followed you into the room and then you falls down in your fit and him he said pointing to the ceiling him devlin was he with me did he see me while i was in the fit no i answered he come home after we'd got you to bed and said he wanted to see you but i wouldn't let him i whipped upstairs here and turned the key so as he shouldn't get at you you did right you did right was he angry if he was he didn't show it he kept with me a long time talking about the the about the what asked lemon the perspiration breaking out on him about the murder well may you shiver it was in the newspaper you brought home with you and he read it out loud and talked about it in a way as froze my blood blood groaned lemon blood oh fanny fanny he is my husband sir and he was suffering and i ain't ashamed to say that i took him in my arms and tried to comfort him one word lemon i said only one word before we go on you ain't guilty are you guilty he answered but speaking quite soft we neither of us raised our voices above a whisper my god no how could i be wasn't i at home in a bed when it was done oh it's horrible horrible and i don't know what to think thank god you're innocent i said and i was so grateful in my heart that my eyes brimmed over and you didn't have nothing to do with the planning of it tell me that no fanny he said him upstairs there did he sleep at home last night unless there's something going on too awful to think of i said he did i ain't been in bed lemon since home you come yesterday and had your fit and here in this room i've been setting with you from the time i put the chain on the street door last night till now i've only left you once to take in the milk at seven o'clock this morning and then the chain was on it hadn't been touched no one went out of this house last night by the street door they couldn't have gone out no other way said lemon i don't see how they could i said though i had my thoughts and the night before fanny said lemon and now he looked at me as if life and death was in my answer the night it was done did he sleep at home then to the best of my belief he did i said you may put me on the rack and tear me with red-hot pinchers and i can't say nothing but the truth he did sleep here the night that awful murder was done in victoria park drag me to the witness-box and put me in irons and i can't say nothing else i saw him go to his room after i'd put up the chain he called out good night and the next morning the chain was up just as i left it you can't put the chain on the street door from the outside it must be done from the inn and now lemon listen to me what do you want he groaned oh what do you want ain't i bad enough already that you try to make me worse i must say lemon what is on my mind won't it keep fanny he asked it won't keep i answered you know the man has committed the murder and you'll come with me to the police station and put the police on his track me know the wretch lemon cried his eyes almost starting out of his head have you gone mad no lemon i answered i'm in my sober senses whatever happens afterwards we've got to face the consequences or we shall wake up in the middle of the night and see that poor girl standing at our bedside pointing her finger at us it's no use trying to disguise it i know you know the wretch and deny it you shan't oh he said speaking very slow as if he was choosing words you know i know him i do i answered perhaps he said with something like a click in his throat you will tell me how that's possible when it's gospel truth i've never set eyes on him all my born days lemon i said be careful oh be careful how you speak of gospel truth remember ananias you may beat about the bush as much as you like 
but I'm determined to do what I've made up my mind to, and nothing shall drive me from it. Of course, he said, upon that, and speaking flippant, if you've made up your mind to the extent you speak of, I'd best shut my mouth. I'll keep it shut till you tell me how you know what you say you know. Lemon, I said, light you speak, but set you don't feel. You can't deceive me. When we was first married, you slept the sleep of innocence, and your breathing was that regular as showed you had nothing on your mind to take exception to. But since that Devlin come into the house, the way you've gone on of a night is simply awful. Jumping about in bed as you've been doing night after night, and screaming and talking in your sleep. "'Talking in my sleep?' he cried, and I saw that I'd scared him. "'You shouldn't have let me. Call yourself a wife? You should have stopped me.' "'I couldn't help letting you, and I couldn't have stopped you, Lemon, and I'm not sure whether it would have been right to do it if such was in my power.' "'What have I said? What have I said?' he asked. "'The night before last as ever was,' I said, when that dreadful deed was done as was printed in the paper you brought home yesterday, you said, while you was laying asleep on the very bed you're laying on now, words as chilled my blood, and it's a mercy I'm alive to tell it. You spoke of Victoria Park, you spoke of a beautiful young girl with hair the colour of gold, you spoke, oh, Lemon, Lemon, you spoke of her being stabbed to the heart, you spoke of a bunch of white daisies as she wore in her belt, and you said there was blood on em. I had to stop myself, sir, for Lemon had hid his face in the bedclothes, and was shaking like a man with Sam Vitus's dance in his marrow. I let him lay till he got over it a bit, and then he uncovered his face. It was as white as a sheet. Fanny, he said, and he was hardly able to get his words out. There's the Bible on the mantel-shelf there. Bring it to me. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I fetched the Bible, sir, and he took it in his hand, and swore a most solemn oath and kissed the book on it that he didn't know the man, that he didn't know the girl, and that he had no more to do with the murder than a babe unborn. Never in my life did I see a man in such a state as he was. "'But, Lemon,' I said, "'how could you come to speak such words? How could you come to know all about the murder hours and hours before it was done?' "'I'll tell you, Fanny,' he said, "'as fur as I know.' and if you was to cut me in a thousand pieces, I couldn't tell you more. It ain't to be expected, I said. If there's men in the world, Lemon went on, as can look into the future, Devlin's one of em. If there's men in the world as can tell you what's going to happen, without having anything to do with it theirselves, mind, Devlin's one of em. The things he's told me of people is unbelievable, but as true as true can be. Did you take particular notice of the gentleman whose hair I've been just cutting? He said to me. No, says I, why should I? He's the great Mr. Danebury that all the world's talking of, says he. Is he? says I. I wonder what brings him to our shop. What a charitable man he is. What a good, good man he is. Good ain't the word for him, says Devlin. He comes to our shop because it's out of the way. All the while I was operating on him, he was thinking of a little milliner's girl as he's got an appointment with to-night. Pretty little Phoebe, he was saying to hisself as I was cutting his hair. What eyes she's got, blue and swimming. What a skin she's got, like satting. It is so white and smooth. What lips she's got. She's a bit of spring, just budding pretty little phoebe pretty little phoebe but what was he saying that for i asks he can't be in love with her he's a family man ain't he i should think he was a family man says devlin he's got the most beautiful wife a man could wish for and as good as she's beautiful 
and he's got half a dozen blooming children. But that don't prevent his being in love with pretty little Phoebe, and he's got an appointment with her to-night, and what's more, he's going to keep it. I'm putting a true case to you, Fanny, says Lemon, one of many such. I fires up at what Devlin says about such a good man, that is, I used to fire up when things first commenced. I don't dispute with him now. I know it's no use, and that he's always right, and me always wrong. But then I did, and I asks him how dare he talk like that of such a man as Mr. Danebury, as gives money to charities, and talks about being everybody's friend. Oh, you don't believe me, Devlin says. Well, come with me to-night, and we'll just see for ourselves. And I go with him and I see a pretty little girl walking up and down the dark, turning at the bottom of the Langham Hotel. Up and down she walks, up and down, up and down. That must be her, says Devlin. We keep watching a little way off on the other side of the way, where it's darker still than where she's walking and waiting, and presently who should come up to her but the great Mr. Danebury, and he takes her hand and holds it long, and they stand talking and he says something to make her laugh, and then he tucks her arm in his and walks off with her. "'What do you think of that?' Devlin asks. "'He's going to take her to a meeting of the Missionary Society.' "'What I think of it makes me melancholy, and makes me ask myself, "'Can such things be?' "'At another time,' Devlin says, "'I shouldn't wonder if you heard of a big fire tomorrow. "'Why do you say that?' I asks. The man who's just gone out, Devlin answers, was thinking of one while I was shampooing him, that's all. And that was all. But sure enough, I do read of a big fire tomorrow in a great place of business that's heavily insured, and there's lives lost and dreadful scenes. And then sometimes when Devlin and me is setting together, he gets up all of a sudden and stands over me, and what he does to me I couldn't tell you if you was to burn me alive. But my senses seem to go, and I either gets fancies, or Devlin puts em in my head. But when I come to, there's Devlin settin' before me, and he says, I'll wager, says he, that I'll tell you what you've been dreaming of. Have I been asleep? I asks. Sound, he answers, and talking in your sleep and he tells me something dreadful that I've said about something that's going to happen. And before the week's out it does happen, and I read of it in the papers. For a long time this has been going on till I've got it in that state that I'd as soon die as live. If you don't understand what I'm trying to explain, Fanny, said my poor Lemon, it ain't my fault. It's as dark to me as it is to you. Sometimes I says to Devlin, I'll go and warn the police. Do, says Devlin, and be took up as a accomplice, and be follered about all your life like a thief or a murderer. Go and tell, and get yourself hanged or clapped in a madhouse. Of course, I see the sense of that, and I keep my mouth shut, but I get miserabler and miserabler. So the day before yesterday, that's Friday, Fanny, Devlin and me is sitting in the private room of the Twisted Cow, when he asks me whether I've ever been to Victoria Park, and I answers, lots of times. Now, Fanny, said Lemon, breaking off in his awful confession, if you ain't prepared to believe what's coming, I'll say no more. It'll sound unbelievable, but I can't help that. Things has happened without me having anything to do with them and I'd need to be a sperrit instead of a man to account for em. Lemon, I said, I'm prepared to believe everything, only don't keep nothing from me. I won't, said Lemon. I'll tell you as near and as straight as I can what happened after Devlin asked me whether I'd ever been to Victoria Park. His eyes was fixed upon me that strange that I felt my senses slipping away from me. It wasn't that things went round so much as they seemed to fade away and become nothing at all. Was I setting in the private room of the Twisted Cow? I don't know. Was it day or night? I don't know. I wouldn't swear to it, though the moon was shining through the trees. 
the trees where why in victoria park and no place else and there was a man and a woman a young beautiful woman with golden hair and a bunch of white daisies in her belt talking together how do i know that she's young and beautiful when i didn't see her face that's one of the things i'm unable to answer and i don't see the man's face either whether a minute passed or a hour before i heard a shriek i can't say and perhaps it ain't material and upon the shriek there near the water laid the young girl dead with the bunch of white daisies in her belt stained with blood then everything disappeared and trembling and shaking to that degree that i felt as if i must fall to pieces i looked up and round and found myself in the private room of the twisted cow with devlin sitting opposite me dreaming again lemon he says with a grin but i don't answer him my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth that's all i know fanny whether i saw what i've told you or was told it or only fancied it is beyond me what i've said is the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help me god that's what i heard from lemon's own lips this morning sir upstairs abed where he is laying now with the door locked on him i took off my hat and cloak and lemon burst out crying you believe me fanny he cried i believe every word you said i answered it's no use going to the police station this morning a good friend of ourn is coming to see me to-day and we'll wait and do what he advises us only you must promise to see him and i told him who you was and why i wrote to you on friday before poor lizzie melladew met her death i promise said lemon and you've done right fanny and now sir i've told you everything as i said i would and you know as much as i do about this dreadful business End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of devlin the barber by b l fargin this librivox recording is in the public domain this was the story which fanny related to me and to which i listened in wonder and amazement as she related it i wondered at times whether it was possible that what she said could be true but i saw no reason to question her veracity and there certainly could be no doubt of her sincerity i had to some extent conquered the fascination which lemon's portrait on the wall the stuffed bird in its glass case and the evil-looking monster on the mantel-shelf had exercised over me but even now i could scarcely gaze upon them without a shudder fanny did not relate her story straight off without a break and i need hardly say that it was much longer than is here transcribed but i have omitted no important point everything pertinent to the tragedy of the murder of mr melladew's daughter is faithfully set down when she finished it was quite dark at my request she had not lighted lamp or candle there were breaks as i have said twice she left off and went upstairs to see lemon and give him something to eat and drink he knows you're here sir she said when she returned on the first occasion is he impatient to see me i asked no sir she replied all he seems to want is to be left alone but he will see me oh yes sir he'll keep his promise once there was an interval of more than half an hour during which i ate some cold meat and bread she brought me and drank a pint bottle of stout there was another occasion when she suddenly paused with her finger at her lips what are you stopping for fanny i asked speak low sir she said devlin where i said much startled he has just opened the street door sir i heard nothing fanny no sir you wouldn't you don't know his ways as i do don't speak for a minute or two sir i waited and strained my ears but no footfall reached my ears presently fanny said he's gone up to his room he waited outside lemon's door and tried it i think 
have you any notion what you are going to do about him sir my ideas are not yet formed but i intend to see and speak with him you do sir i do fanny a special providence has directed my steps here to-day i knew the poor girl who has been murdered sir her family and mine have been friends for years the interest i take in the discovery of the murderer is no common interest and i intend to bring him to justice how sir exclaimed fanny greatly excited through mr devlin the way will suggest itself you have not heard him leave the house since he entered a little while since no sir he is in his room now if i said when i am with your husband and i intend to remain with him but a short time devlin comes downstairs let me know immediately keep watch for him oh, i will sir oh how thankful i am that you're here how thankful how thankful i hope we shall all have reason to be thankful and now fanny i will go up to your husband i'll go in first and prepare him sir let us have lights in the house don't leave mr lemon in the dark put a candle in the passage also she followed my instructions and then we went to her husband's bedroom i waited outside while she prepared him it did not take long to do so and she came to the door and beckoned to me i entered the room and desired her to leave us alone but don't lock us in i added no sir she said lemon's safe now you're with him with that she retired first smoothing the bedclothes and the pillow with a kind of pitying soothing motion as though lemon was about to undergo an operation i moved the candle so that its light fell upon lemon's face a scared frightened face it was that turned towards me the face of a man who had received a deadly shock it is unnecessary to say more than a few words about what passed between mr lemon and myself my purpose was to obtain from him confirmation of the strange mystery story which fanny had related in this purpose i succeeded it was correct in every particular what i elicited from lemon was elicited in the form of questions which i put to him and which he answered sometimes readily sometimes reluctantly had time not been so precious my curiosity would have impelled me to go into matters respecting devlin other than the murder of lizzie melladew but i felt there was not a minute to waste and at the termination of my interview with lemon i went into the passage where i found fanny waiting for me whispering to her not to remain there in order that devlin might not be too strongly prejudiced against me supposing him to be on the watch as well as ourselves and receiving from her instructions as to the position of his room i mounted the stairs with a firm loud tread and stood in the dark at the door which was to conduct me to the presence of the mysterious being End of chapter eighteen Chapter Nineteen of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I rapped my knuckles, and a voice which could have been none other than the voice of Devlin immediately responded, calling to me to enter. The next moment I stood face to face with the strange creature, concerning whom my curiosity was raised to the highest pitch. He was sitting in a chair upon my entrance, and he did not rise from it. Therefore I looked down upon him, and he looked up at me. As my eyes rested on his face, I saw in it the inspiration of the evil expression in the faces of Mr. Lemon's portrait, the stone monster, and the bird's beak, which had made so profound an impression upon me in the parlour on the ground floor. "'You have been in the house some time,' said Devlin i have i answered and have had a long a very long conversation with my worthy landlady he observed yes i said about me he said not in the form of a question but as a statement of fact partly about you and about poor lemon yes about him as well sit down said devlin i expected you there was only one other chair in the room besides the one he occupied and i accepted his invitation and drew it up to the table 
and there we sat gazing at each other for what appeared to me a long time in silence the room was very poorly furnished there were the two chairs a small deal table and a single iron bedstead in the corner off the room was a kind of closet in which i supposed were a washstand and fittings there was only one other article in view in addition to those i have mentioned and that was a desk at which devlin was writing he did not put away his papers and i was enabled to observe without undue prying that his writing was very fine and very close how shall i describe him a casual observation of his face and figure would not suffice for the detection of anything uncanny about him but it must be remembered that i was abnormally excited and most strangely interested in him he was tall and dark his face was long and spare his forehead was low his eyes were black with an extraordinary brilliance in them his mouth was large and his lips thin he wore a moustache but no beard in the order and importance of the impressions they produced upon me i should place first his black eyes with their extraordinary brilliancy and next his hands which were unusually small and white they were the hands of a lady of gentle culture rather than those of a man in the class of life to which devlin appeared to belong not alone was his social standing presumably fixed by the fact of his living in a room so poorly furnished at the top of a house so common as mr lemon's but his clothes were a special indication they were shabby and worn black frock coat black trousers and waistcoat narrow black tie not a vestige of colour about them and no sign of jewellery of any kind well he said i started i had been so absorbed in my observance of him that i who should have been the first to plunge into the conversation had remained silent for a time so unreasonably long that the man upon whom i had intruded might have justly taken offence i beg your pardon i said did you not remark that you expected me yes may i inquire upon what grounds your expectation was based he smiled and here i observed in the quality of this smile a characteristic of which mrs lemon had given me no indication devlin was evidently gifted with a touch of humour i reason by analogy he said my landlady has very few visitors you are here for the first time with an object you remain closeted with her for hours she probably sent for you during the long interview downstairs you have been told a great deal about me you hear me open the street door and you know i am in the house my landlady has a trouble on her mind and mixes me up with it you have been made acquainted with this trouble and with my supposed connection with it your curiosity has been aroused and you determine to seek an interview with me before you take your leave of her you come up uninvited and here you are as i expected am i logical quite logical in a common-sense view of commonplace matters and everything in the world is commonplace lies the ripest wisdom follow my example exercise your common sense but i did not immediately speak devlin's words were so different from what i had expected that i was for a moment at a loss the prospect of my being able to bring the murderer of lizzie melladew to justice and of earning a thousand pounds did not appear so bright i will assist you he resumed i will endeavour to set you at your ease with me your scrutiny of me has been very searching i ought to feel flattered what anticipations of my appearance you may have entertained before you entered the room is your affair and not mine how far they are realised is your affair not mine but allow me to assure you my dear sir and here he rose to his full height and made me a half humorous half mocking bow that i am a very ordinary person that cannot be i said after what i have heard it is the destiny he said resuming his seat of greater personages than myself to be ranked much higher than they deserve proceed i am here to speak to you about this murder i said plunging boldly into the subject ah about a murder but there are so many you know to which one i refer the murder of a young girl in victoria park which took place the night before last 
"'I have heard and read of it,' said Devlin. "'You know also,' I continued, "'that the tragedy has produced in Mr. Lemon a condition of mind and body which may lead to dangerous results, probably to a despairing death.' "'All men must die,' he said cynically. I was now thoroughly aroused. "'I have come to you for an explanation,' I said, "'and it must be a satisfactory one.' "'You speak like an inquisitor,' said Devlin, with a quiet smile, and I seemed to detect in his altered manner a desire to irritate me and to drive me into an excess of passion. For this reason I kept myself cool, and simply said, "'I am resolved.' "'Good. Keep resolved.' "'I shall do so. By some devilish and mysterious means you were aware, before the poor girl left her home on Friday night, that her doom was sealed. You could have prevented it, and you did not raise a hand to save her. This knowledge I have gained from Mr. Lemon, to whom, through you, the impending tragedy was known. Then why did he not prevent it? It was not in his power. He was not acquainted with the names of the murderer and his victim. Was I? You must have been. I do not pretend to an understanding of the extraordinary power you exercise, but I am convinced that, in connection with you, there is a mystery which should be brought to light, and if I can be the agent to unmask you, I am ready for the work. With all the earnestness of my soul, I swear it." A low laugh escaped Devlin's lips. "'Were a commissioner of lunacy here,' he said, "'you would be in peril. This young girl you speak of, is she in any way connected with you?' "'She was my friend. I knew her from childhood. She has sat at my table with her sister and parents, and I and mine have sat at theirs. Her family are plunged into the lowest depths of despair by the cruel, remorseless blow which has fallen upon them. And you have taken upon yourself the task of an avenger. It is chivalrous, but is it entirely unselfish? I am always suspicious of mere words. There is ever behind them a secret motive, hidden by a dark curtain. I speak in metaphor, but you will seize my meaning, for you are a man of nerve and intelligence, utterly unlike our friend in the room below, whose nature is servile and abject, and who is not, as you are, given to heroics. Calm yourself. I am ready to discuss this matter with you, but in your present condition I should have the advantage of you. You are heated. I am cool and collected. You have some self-interest at heart. I have none. Your words are so wild that any person but myself hearing them would take you for a madman. For your own sake, not for mine, for the affair does not concern me, I advise moderation of language. I suppose you will scarcely believe that the man upon whom you have unceremoniously intruded, and against whom you launch accusations, the very extravagance of which renders them unworthy of serious consideration, you will scarcely believe that this man is simply a poor barber who has not a second coat to his back, nor a second pair of shoes to his feet. But it is a fact, a proof of the injustice of the world, ever blind to merit. For I am not only a barber, sir, I am a capable workman, as I will convince you. Pray do not move. A cooling essence and a brush skilfully used effect wonders on an overheated head. It was not in my power to resist him. He had taken his place behind my chair, and before he had finished speaking, had sprinkled a liquid over my head, which was so overpoweringly refreshing that I insensibly yielded to its influence. With brush and comb he arranged my hair, his small white hands occasionally touching my forehead gently and persuasively. When I thought afterwards of this strange incident, I called to mind that, for the two or three minutes during which he was engaged in the exercise of his art, I was in a kind of quiet dream, in which all the agitating occurrences of the previous day, in connection with the murder of Lizzie Melladew, were mentally repeated in proper sequence, closing with Mr. Portland's offer of a thousand pounds for the discovery of the murderer. It was, as it were, a kind of panorama which passed before me of all that occurred between morning and night. I looked up, inexpressibly refreshed, and with my mind bright and clear. Devlin stood before me, smiling. "'Confess, sir,' he said, in a soft, persuasive tone, 
that I have returned good for evil. The fever of the brain is abated, for I am a bungler indeed. We will now discuss the matter. End of chapter 19 Chapter Twenty of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I remarked to you just now, he said, seating himself comfortably in his chair, that I am always suspicious of mere words, for the reason that there is ever a secret motive behind them. From what you have said, I should be justified in supposing that your desire to discover the mystery in which the death of your poor young friend is involved springs simply from sympathy with her bereaved family. I will not set a trap for you, and pin you to that statement, by asking questions which you would answer only in one way. You would argue with yourself, probably, as to the disingenuousness of those answers, but would finally appease your conscience by deciding that I, a perfect stranger to you and your affairs, cannot possibly have anything to do with the private motives by which you are influenced say for instance by such a motive as the earning of a reward which we will put down at a thousand pounds for the life of me i could not restrain a start of astonishment it was the exact sum mr portland had offered me by what dark means had devlin divined it you need not be discomposed said devlin the thing is natural enough you have credited me with so much that it will harm neither of us if you credit me with a little more, say, with a certain faculty for reading men's thoughts. The world knows very little as yet. It has much to learn. And I, in my humble way, may be a master in a new species of spiritual power. Now I have a profound belief in fate. What it wills must inevitably be. And, impressed by this article of faith, I, the master, may be willing to become the slave. Fate has led you to this house, and it may be that you are an instrument in discoveries yet to be made. I continue, you observe, to speak occasionally in metaphor. Be as frank with me as I have been with you. No, don't trouble yourself to speak immediately. In the words you were about to utter, there is a subterfuge. You have not yet made up your mind to be entirely open with me. You and I meet now for the first time. Before this day I have never known of your existence, nor have you been aware of mine. If that be true, I said, interrupting him, what made you mention the reward of a specific sum? Of a thousand pounds? he asked, smiling. Exactly. Do you deny that such a reward has been offered to you? I do not deny it. But by what mysterious means did you come to the knowledge of it? Because it is in your mind, my dear sir, he said. That is no answer. Is it not? I should have thought it would satisfy you, but you are inclined to be unreasonable. Come, now, I will show you how little I am concealing from you with respect to my knowledge of your movements. He shaded his eyes with his hand, and looked at me from beneath it. I do not know your name, nor in what part of London you reside, but certainly you and your wife, no doubt a most estimable lady, were sitting together at breakfast yesterday morning. He paused and waited for me to speak. It is quite true, I said, but there is nothing unusual in husband and wife partaking of that meal in company. Nothing in the least unusual, if a man is master of his own time, as you were yesterday morning, for the first time for a long while past. The fact is, you had lost a situation in which you have been employed for years. I sat spellbound. Devlin continued. The breakfast things are on the table, and you and your lady are discussing ways and means. You are not rich, and you look forward with some fear to the future. Times are hard, and situations are not easy to obtain. In the midst of your consultation, a man rushes into the room. He is a middle-aged man. Shall I describe him? If you can, I said, I wonder growing. He gave me a fairly faithful description of Mr. Melladew, and proceeded. A great grief has fallen upon this man. It is only within the last hour that he has discovered that his daughter had been murdered. He remains with you some time, and then other persons make their appearance, among them newspaper reporters and policemen, 
all doubtless drawn to your house by this business of the murder. You have also an interview with a young gentleman. The day passes, it is evening, and you are seated with another person. By this person you are offered one thousand pounds if you discover the murderer of the young girl, and another thousand if you find her sister, who has strangely disappeared. I do not wish to deprive you of such credit as belongs to a man who sympathizes with a friend in trouble, but it is certainly a fact that the dim prospect of earning such a handsome sum of money is very strong within you. That is all. I deliberated a while in silence, and Devlin did not disturb my musings. All that he had narrated had passed through my mind while he was engaged in dressing my hair. Had he the power of reading thoughts by the mere action of his fingers upon a man's head? No other solution occurred to me, and had I not been placed in my present position I should instantly have rejected it. But now I was in the mood for entertaining it, wild and incredible as it appeared. During this interval of silence I made a strong endeavour to calm myself for what was yet to take place between me and Devlin, and I was successful. When I spoke I was more composed. "'You say you do not know where I live. Is it true?' I asked. "'Quite true,' he answered. "'You do not really know my name?' "'I do not.' "'Nor the names of my visitors?' "'Nor the names of your visitors.' "'But you must be aware,' I said, admitting, for the sake of argument, that you are not romancing. "'Yes,' he said, laughing, admitting that, for the sake of argument. "'You must be aware that the name of the first man who visited me, he being, as you have declared, the father of the murdered girl, is Melodieu. "'I am aware of it, not from actual knowledge, but from what I have read in the newspapers. "'But of the name of the gentleman who, you say, offers the reward of a thousand pounds, you are ignorant. Quite ignorant. Now, having replied to your questions frankly, confess that you have forced yourself upon me with a distinct motive, in which I, a stranger to you, am interested. My object is to discover the murderer and bring him to justice. A very estimable design. And also to discover what has become of the murdered girl's sister. Exactly. How do you propose to accomplish your object? Through you. Indeed, through me? As surely as we are in the same room together, through you. Receive what I am about to say as the fixed resolve of a man who sees before him a stern duty and will not flinch from it. Having come into association with you, I am determined not to lose sight of you. I put aside any further consideration of a strange and inexplicable mystery in connection with yourself as being utterly and entirely beyond my power to understand. "'My dear sir,' said Devlin, with a glance at his shabby clothes, "'you flatter me. All my energies now are bent to one purpose, which, through you, I shall carry to its certain end. You have made yourself plain to me. I hope up to this point I have made myself plain to you.' "'You are the soul of lucidity,' said Devlin, "'but much remains yet to explain. "'For the sake of argument, "'we have admitted an element of romance "'into this very prosaic matter. "'For it is really prosaic, almost commonplace. "'Life is largely made up of tragedies and mysteries, "'the majority of them petty and contemptible, "'a few only deserving to be called grand. "'As a matter of fact, my dear sir, existence, with all its worries, anxieties, hopes and disappointments, is nothing better than a game of pins and needles. It is the littleness of human nature that magnifies a pinprick into a wound of serious importance. To think that some of these mortals should call themselves philosophers. It is laughable. Do you follow me? Not entirely, I replied, but I have some small glimmering of your meaning. Were your mind, said Devlin, shaking with internal laughter. Quite free from the influence of that thousand pounds, it would be clearer. In the grand scheme of nature, so far as mortals comprehend it, the potent screw is human selfishness. These speculations, however, are perhaps foreign to the point. Let us continue our amicable argument until we thoroughly understand each other upon the subject of this murder. You see, my dear sir, I wish to know exactly how I stand. For despite the extraordinary opinion you have formed of me, it is you who have assumed the role of controller of destinies. 
I am but a mere instrument in your hands.' He measured me with his eyes. "'You are well built, and are, I should judge, a powerful man.' "'You are contemplating the probability of a physical struggle between us,' I said. "'Dismiss it. There will be none.' He made me a mocking bow. "'My mind is, indeed, relieved. You do not intend violence, then. I am free to leave the house if I wish, at this moment, if I please. Have you taken that contingency into account?' "'I have. You will not attempt to detain me by force?' "'No. In such an event, how will you act?' "'I shall follow you, and to the first policeman I meet, I shall say, "'Arrest that person. He is implicated in the murder of Lizzie Melladew. Devlin cast upon me a look of admiration. "'That would be awkward,' he said. "'Decidedly awkward, for you. You would be asked to furnish evidence. "'Direct evidence it would be, at present, out of my power to supply,' I said. I was on my mettle. My mental forces were never clearer, were never more resolutely set upon one object. But there is such a thing as circumstantial evidence. Mr. Lemon and his wife should come forward and relate all they know concerning you. You and Mr. Lemon are carrying on a business somewhere. The place should be searched. It should be made food for the multitude, who are ever on the hunt for the sensational. Your desk on the table here contains writings of yours. They may throw light upon the investigation. So we should go on, step by step, independent of your assistance, until we get the murderer, who may or may not be an accomplice of yours, into the clutches of the law. Towards the end of this speech I had risen and approached the window, which faced the square. Mechanically lifting the blind, I looked out, and saw what arrested my attention. By the railings on the opposite side, with his eyes raised to the window, was the figure of a man. He was standing quite motionless, and, the night being fine, with a panoply of stars in the sky, I presently recognized the figure to be that of George Carton, poor Lizzie Melladew's distracted lover. At some little distance from him was the figure of another man, whose movements were distinguished by restlessness, and in him I recognized Carton's guardian, Mr. Kenneth Dowsett. "'Looking for a policeman?' inquired Devlin, with a touch of amusement in his voice. "'No,' I replied, "'but I am pleased to discover that I am not alone, that I have friends outside ready to assist me the moment I call upon them.' Devlin rose and joined me at the window. "'Is your sight very keen?' he asked. "'Keen enough to recognize friends,' I said. "'Mine is wonderful,' said Devlin, "'quite cat-like, another of my abnormal qualities. I can plainly distinguish the features of the two men upon whom we are gazing. One is young. Who is he? His name, I replied, believing that entire frankness would be more likely to win Devlin to my side, is George Carton. I recognize him. He was in your house yesterday morning. He seems distressed. There is a troubled look in his face. He was the murdered girl's lover. Ah! And the other, the elder man? casting anxious glances upon the younger, who may he be? His name is Mr. Kenneth Dowsett. He is young Carton's guardian. Thank you, said Devlin, returning to his seat at the table. I dropped the blind and resumed my seat opposite to him, and then I observed a singular smile upon his face, to which I could attach no meaning. I presented, he said, a certain contingency to you, the contingency of my leaving this house, and you have been delightfully explicit as to the course you would pursue. But, my dear sir, crediting myself with a species of occult power, which you appear ready to grant to me, might it not be in my power to vanish, to disappear from your sight the moment the policeman you would summons attempted to lay hands upon me? I must chance that, I said. Good. Nothing of the sort will occur, I promise. I cannot carry on my pursuit as a shadow. The idea of leaving the house did occur to me. I banish it. Well, then, suppose I remain here. Suppose I put an end to this discussion. Suppose I go to bed. To all your vaporings, suppose I say, Go to the devil. Why on earth do you stare at me so? It is a common saying, and the awful consequences of such a journey are seldom thought of. I repeat, I say to you, Go to the devil. What, then? 
I still could summon a policeman, I said, but even if I postponed that step, or you managed to escape from me, I have a talent which, now that it occurs to me, I shall immediately press into my service. Enlighten me. I took from my pocket some letters, and tore from them three blank leaves, upon which I set to work with pencil. My task occupied me ten minutes and more, during which time Devlin, sitting back in his chair, watched me with an expression of intense amusement in his face. When I had finished, I handed him one of the blank leaves. "'My portrait!' he exclaimed. "'I am an artist myself, as you have seen in Mrs. Lemon's parlour. This picture is the very image of me.' "'There is no mistaking it,' I said complacently. "'It will ensure recognition.' In what way do you propose to turn it to advantage, in the event of my being contumacious? You have, doubtless, I said, noted the changes that have taken place in the life of civilized cities? Excellent, he said. My dear sir, you compel my admiration. You are altogether so different a person from the simpleton who lies shaking in his bed on the floor below. You have brain-power. My worthy landlord and partner would have as well fulfilled his destiny had he been a mouse. The changes that have taken place! Ah! what changes have I not seen, say, in the course of the last thousand years! And here he laughed loud and long. But proceed, my dear sir, proceed. How do these changes affect me in the matter we are now considering? There was a time— Really? like the beginning of a fairy story, he interposed, when public opinion was of small weight, whereas now it is the most important factor in social affairs. Lucidly put, I listen to you with interest. The penny newspaper, I observed sagely, is a mighty engine. You speak with the wisdom of a platitudinarian. It enlists itself in the cause of justice, and frequently plays, to a serviceable end, the part of a detective. You may remember the case of Leroy? A poor bungler, a very poor bungler, a small mind, my dear sir, eaten up by self-conceit of the lowest and meanest quality. For a long time Leroy evaded justice, but at length he was arrested. A popular newspaper published in its columns a portrait of the wretch. I see, said Devlin, and you would publish my portrait in the newspapers? in every paper that would give it admittance, and few would refuse. Beneath it should be words to the effect that it was the portrait of a man who knew, before its committal, that the murder of the poor girl, Lizzie Melladew, was planned, and who must, therefore, be implicated in it. The portrait would lead to your arrest, and then Mr. and Mrs. Lemon would come forward with certain facts. Mr. Devlin, I would make London too hot to hold you, an expressive phrase. Your plan is more than ordinarily clever. It is ingenious. And London, said Devlin thoughtfully, is such a place to work in, such a place to live in, such a place to observe in. To be banished from it would be a great misfortune. What other city in the world is so full of devilment and crime? What other city in the world is so full of revelations? What other city in the world is so full of opportunities? so full of contrasts, so full of hypocrisy and frivolity, so full of cold-blooded villainy. The gutters, with their ripening harvests of vice for jail, find gallows. The perfumed gardens, the fevered courts, the river, with its burden of jewels and beauty, with its burden of woe and despair. The bridges, with their nightly load of hunger, sin and shame. The mansions, with their music and false smiles and aching hearts, the garrets with their dim lights flickering, the bells with their solemn warning, the busy streets with their scheming life, the smug faces, the pinched bellies, the satins, the rags, the social treacheries, the suicides, the secret crimes, the rotting souls. My dear sir, the prospect of your making such a field too hot to hold even such a poor tatterdemalion as myself overwhelms me. What is the alternative? That you pledge yourself, by all that is holy and sacred, to give me your fullest assistance towards the discovery of Lizzie Melladew's murderer. End of chapter 20